Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. So there is one thing that I've never ever covered on this channel, and I, and I suppose I probably shouldn't say that, I'm sure there could be more than one thing, but the, the one thing I'm referencing is printing. And upon my return home from my recent waterfall excursion in last week's video, one of the things I was most interested in with, uh, with this new camera, the, uh, the Fuji GFX 100S, was how well the image is printed. I knew they'd be great, but how great? That was really the, the question and the answer I was after that would ultimately help me with my buying decision. And after all, that's one of the, the biggest benefits of using a, a high resolution camera is its ability to create images that can be printed large with stunning detail. Now, when it comes to printing, my experience is that it's one of the more difficult aspects of photography and at the same time, one of the most rewarding and educational as well. And in this video, I wanna share with you what I've learned from printing my own photos for I guess the, maybe the past four years now, along with perhaps most importantly, the, the mistakes that I made throughout this learning process in hopes that this video will help, I guess, accelerate the learning curve, so to speak, for any of those looking to get started with printing their own landscape photos. Now, there was quite a few comments in last week's video about printing those images off um, as big as I possibly could, and I did print out the uh, my favorite image from that video. I got a couple um, prints here. I made some purposeful mistakes here just to use as examples in this video. And I also have a, a much larger print back there, which is the, the final version, which I'll, I'll show you kind of a, a zoomed in, um, um, like a B-roll clip of that, uh, of that print, just so you can see the detail in those images from the, the Fuji GFX 100S, but it is, it is pretty uh, remarkable how detailed the, uh, the prints came out. So I'm pretty excited about that. But as far as the mistakes are concerned, and these are rated, uh, they're not rated in order of uh, importance. I think they're all extremely important, but um, they're actually rated in order as they occurred throughout my own learning process. So the very first mistake is the very first thing that I encountered when I got my printer. So to jump right into it, the very first mistake is something that I call jumping right in. And what it is, is when I purchased my printer, and I have the, the Canon Pro 1000, which is a fantastic printer. It's not the top of the line. It's not kind of a lower tier. It's kind of right in the middle. But I got the printer at home. I unboxed it. I was super excited. I threw all the ink cartridges in. And I started to um, kind of go through my Lightroom catalog to find my favorite print. And I wanted to print it out. Uh, pulled it up, hit print, and printed it out. That was it. The print came off the printer. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going this doesn't look anything like what I thought it would look like. It doesn't look anything like the image on my computer. And the issue with that is basically that I didn't do my due diligence and I didn't study up and figure out all the steps that are required before you actually print an image. I just figured I could find the photograph and print it. And I started printing image after image after image. And I printed large prints and I wasted a ton of ink and I wasted a ton of paper. Ink's not cheap, the paper's not cheap. And what I should have done is understand the, the required steps involved. And I'll walk you through my entire print workflow here shortly, but I didn't quite understand what was needed to get a image ready for print. And that was one mistake. And then the other mistake is I was printing all these test prints off, which at the time I didn't know were test prints. I thought they were the final prints, but I printed them all large. And you should never print test prints large. You know, in the very beginning, I always take one sheet of paper and I'll print maybe five or six uh, different versions, different tests on that single sheet of paper. It saves you ink, saves you paper. And then once you get the image to a point to where you're, you're starting to feel good about it, then you can start printing a little bit bigger. But jumping right into it without doing the, the proper due diligence to figure out the steps involved, that was a major, major mistake. Now the second mistake, and this is probably the most common, this is the one you hear the most about, and it's something that I call uncalibrated monitor. And this is the, the calibration device that I use. This is the X-Rite i1. And there's a ton of these on the market. They're not super expensive. I think this one was around $100. And I'll link it below if you wanna take a look at this one. But they're real simple to use. They basically hang on your monitor on the screen, kind of like this. And uh, they come with software that you load on your computer. It starts flashing all these kind of crazy colors on your screen. And this device measures how those colors are rendered on your particular screen. And then it can make any kind of adjustment because all, all monitors are shipped a little bit differently. I know my Apple iMac 5K monitor and my MacBook Pro, they all seem to be a little bit cooler uh, straight from the factory. And once I calibrated it, it kind of warmed up a lot of those um, of, of the tones in the screen. But most importantly, at least in my mind, it's the thing that I struggle with a lot, but this kind of helped to solve it, is that it measures the ambient light in the room. 
and it'll adjust the screen brightness. And on both my, my iMac and my MacBook Pro, it actually lowered the screen brightness to just maybe I think two stops underneath or two like little dashes underneath halfway. And I think that's a real big issue is because you can turn the screen brightness up on your screen all the way, and that's gonna completely skew the way your prints might turn out. So I would recommend getting a calibration device that can also measure the ambient light in your room and go ahead and adjust the screen brightness there. But uh, calibrating your monitor is a very, very crucial step. And it's something that I printed for about three or four months before I even knew that calibrating a monitor was a thing. Now the third mistake is something that I call single paper. Now most printers will come with a kind of trial package of paper to test out. My printer was no different. And uh, I printed, you know, I, I quickly burned through the, the trial paperwork, paperwork, the trial paper that my Canon printer came with. And then I immediately just went to Canon's website. Actually, I ordered it from Amazon and ordered just the same paper. And I printed on the same exact paper for months after month after month and I never changed. And the paper was great, and I still use it still to this day. But I didn't kind of expand my horizons at all. And there's so many different fantastic paper manufacturers out there, and there's so many different types of print that will all result in a completely different end result. You know, you have you have matte paper, you have gloss, semi-gloss, lusters. There's a lot of different types of paper out there. And it helps you kind of the educational process of it all because Certain images print better on certain types of paper. So if maybe a black and white image will look better on a matte paper or maybe a, a really vibrant or an image that's got a ton of punchy colors in it, that'll look better on a, on a kind of high gloss or semi-gloss or maybe a luster type of paper. And just going through that process and broadening your horizons and testing different types of paper will just help you to better understand exactly what type of an image will look best on a certain type of paper. And these are the types of paper that I use right now. This is a henna muley. This is a fine art paper. This is a, a matte smooth paper. This is very nice. I like this one a lot. And then this is the, the other paper I use. This is the, uh, the semi-gloss from Canon. This is the type of paper that my printer comes with. It comes with a, a much smaller size, but this is the, the largest size that my printer will actually print. But this is a fantastic paper as well. But there's, those are the two that I, whoops, those are the two that I use mostly, but just testing out a bunch of different types of paper is definitely gonna help you in your, your overall learning curve and your, your printing journey as well. Now, the, the fourth mistake, and this is a really big one, it's something that I call no paper profiles. And I'll start to kind of show you, walk you through my overall printing process here. But a paper profile, I've heard this described as kind of like a language. There's, there's many different languages all around the world, and there's many different ways to say a singular word. So maybe the word print is the word print in every single language, but it's said completely differently. I, I hope that made sense. But when I heard that comparison, I was like, okay, that makes sense of what a, a paper profile is. And you can download these from most um, paper manufacturers website, just kind of punch in exactly what paper profile you're looking for, for what type of a uh, paper that uh, you're using of that manufacturers, and you can download it. It's all for free and you can load it directly into Lightroom. And it's really cool what it will help you do. So as far as my process is concerned, this is my favorite image from that waterfall trip in last week's video. I always come up here to the develop module. And the very first thing I do is come down here to soft proofing. You don't notice that that changed the actual border around the image to white, but that's not only what it does. And it's nowhere even close to the most important thing that it does in my opinion, but it adds this dialogue box right up here. And this is where you can actually select the paper profile. So if you come up here to profile and drop this down, these are the two uh, profiles that I have logged or have available on my MacBook Pro. Most of the printing I do is on my iMac. But um, if I select this right here, fo uh, Henemuli Photo Rag, and I select this right here, Simulate Paper and Ink, watch what happens to the photograph. It completely changes it. And what that's doing is it's basically accounting for the paper profile for that type of paper. And Lightroom's trying to kind of give you an accurate description or a representation, I should say, of what that image will look like using that paper profile, using that paper. And then you can make any kind of tweaks from there. So if I change this to a different type of Hennemulli paper, smooth, you notice that changed it a little bit as well. Now the fifth and final mistake is something that I call not print editing. And this is a big one. And it's, it goes in line with the very first mistake when I first started printing. I, I, I didn't even pay attention to the fact that the way that you see an image on a screen is totally different than the way it was printed. So if you don't do any printing right now, none at all, then you're editing your images for the screen. You're editing them for your website, you're, you're editing them for Instagram, whatever the case may be, 
they're going to be viewed on a screen. And all screens are backlit. They all have a light source behind them. But when you start to print your photographs, that light source is removed. You no longer have that. And that completely changes the entire ball game. So you have to make some um, subtle changes. Sometimes the changes are, are, are large changes. Sometimes it's very minor. But I, in my experience, I've always had to make some changes. So what I'll do is I, I, get, I go into Lightroom and I'll select the paper profile. Let's just say I'm going to use this one right here. And then as soon as you start to make a change, let's say I'm just going to increase the brightness a touch. Lightroom is going to ask you if you want to create a virtual copy for soft proofing. And I always say create proof copy. And it's basically, it's going to create a virtual copy just for this print. Just that way you don't make any changes to the actual raw file. And this file right here, this is actually a TIFF file. I edited this image in Capture One, sent it over to Photoshop to finish it up. And then I'm going to send it over to Lightroom now to do the actual printing. But in my experience, I almost always have to increase the exposure a little bit on my photographs. And then maybe out on this one, maybe decrease the blacks just a little bit. And then maybe sometimes if you have an image on the screen that might look a little bit flat already, maybe you want to increase the contrast a little bit before you print it. But going through that exercise, the, the more you do it, the better you're going to get. And it just takes practice. But like I said, in my experience, I always have to make some tweaks to my images. And it's usually increase the exposure a little bit because that light source is going to be removed from the, the paper, of course, because it's not going to be viewed on a screen. And a lot of times I might have to decrease the black point or maybe increase the contrast a little bit. Sometimes in, um, increase or maybe decrease the vibrance of a particular image. But you just have to really practice it. Every photograph is different. And the only way you're really going to get better at it is just by doing it more often. And I've improved. I think when I first started creating test prints, sometimes it would take me 20 or 30 test prints before I got an image really dialed into where I was happy with it. Now I can usually get it done maybe in five or maybe 10, depending on the specific photograph. But you don't always have to get the print to look exactly like what you see on the screen. It's all personal preference. I try and get it as close as I possibly can to the screen, but some images are really difficult and you just can't do it. But I do try and get it to closely resemble what I see on the screen. But once I get it to a point to where I, I'm happy with the way it looks, I'll come up here to uh, print. And this is the actual print module. And then I will always come down here to page setup. And this is where you can kind of change the orientation. So I just flip it to, whoops, I hit the wrong one. Page setup, if I flip it to this orientation, you'll see it flips it to vertical. If I go back, put it to right here, it's gonna change it there. And you can actually change the, the paper size right here. You can put a custom size in right here. And then you select your printer that you're gonna be using. I have the Canon Pro 1000. And then just select OK. Then I come down to image setting and then layout. Layout's where you're gonna change your margins. So you can do half inch, one inch. I usually do something between, usually maybe around half inch or one inch. Let's just change this to one inch all the way around. So the left, right, top, and bottom. And then what, something to note here, you have this zoom to fill button right here at the top. And if you select this, you'll see what it's doing because you can see the border right here and the image is not filling it. But if I hit zoom to fill, the image will fill that up. And then you can grab the image, you can kind of move it around to center it up. And that's handy because some images are shot in different types of aspect ratios, or maybe you have it cropped a certain way. And sometimes you do have to use that. Ideally, you won't have to use that because you don't want to lose any of your photograph, but sometimes you just have to. But that's just something good to note that you do have that option up there. So, and then once you have your margins set up, I, I don't really do anything with the guides. I don't do anything here with the page. I don't do anything with like identity plates or watermarks or anything like that. And then as far as the print job is concerned, I always leave this print resolution on 300 pixels per inch, print sharpening standard, and then the media type if you're using matte or glossy paper. And then I always leave this on a 16-bit output as well because my printer prints 16-bit. And in the profile, you, I always select a manage by the specific paper profile that I'm using as well, because that's going to help the printer ultimately determine exactly the best way to print this particular photograph on that particular paper. And that's really the process that I go through. And then I'll come up here to a printer. And then you, this is kind of just the basic stuff. I always put the media or I set the media in quality right here to best. And then I hit print and then it prints it off. And then kind of go through that process a couple of times until I get it really dialed in. But those are the five mistakes that I, that I encountered. And I really do hope that that process will help anyone who's looking to, to get into printing, kind of like I mentioned earlier, accelerate that learning curve, so to speak. Now, as far as the, the big print goes from the, the Fuji GFX 100S, um, I, I won't hold it up because I know you won't be able to see it well, but I will overlay some B-roll. 
of the close-up of this image. And I wish I had a macro lens so I could really show you how great the detail looks in this image. But you can really see all the, the tiny little detail and all the, the leaves and all the foliage and especially in areas where the, the light is hitting these rocks. I mean, the, the detail that came out of this is just absolutely incredible. And this is the biggest version of this photograph that I could print on my printer here. Uh, maybe I could print it a little bit bigger, but for the most part, that's as big as it would go. And I think that the bigger I print this image, the more that detail is really going to jump out. And I probably will outsource a print and just print it up to a couple feet by a couple feet maybe even bigger than that, just to see how good it actually does look. But the, the results coming off of the print are very, very impressive, and I'm pretty excited about it. So um, I think printing is a ton of fun. Like I mentioned, it's very educational as well. And I think it's because when you, when you look at a photograph on a screen, you don't really look at it as long as you would a print. And when you're looking at a print hanging on a wall, I feel like you spend more time looking at it. You spend more time examining certain areas of the photograph, and especially if it is your print. So I think you end up noticing a lot of things that you might not notice in your image when you are looking at it on a print versus on a screen. So it's going to teach you a lot about your own photography and it's going to teach you a lot about what you like in your images and what you don't like. And it's going to enable you to make changes moving forward. So I think that printing is one of the most beneficial and the most educational things you can do to improve your own photography. So. I do hope that that information was helpful. And before I do wrap up this week's video, I want to say just a, a real big thanks again to the sponsor of this week's video, which is Squarespace, who I use for all of my website and e-commerce needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery just so you can make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends in page visits and views to better optimize your content. And you can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which will enable you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products or blog posts and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you're looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So if you have any questions about this week's video, just uh, leave them in the comment section below and I guarantee I will get back in touch with you. And if you did enjoy this week's video, if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And as always, I really, really do appreciate you watching this week's video and I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.